just Lori and I and the worship group today because Kathy is sick. And Lori's husband is busy today. So it's just her and I. <laughs> and uh, we've got a lot of other people out of town and sick. So we are who we are. And I'm just so glad that you're all here today. Uh, we're going to start with uh, a, a hymnal song that has been a favorite of mine for years and years. It's called, There is Sunshine in My Soul. Remember that? Amen. Remember that song? Well, that's what we're going to sing. Okay, here we go. There is sunshine in my soul today.
our scripture and pray for us, please. I'll be reading from Matthew 5, verse 1 through 9. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up to them, up and up on the mountains, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. He opened his mouth and began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are those who are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Amen. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Shall we pray? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us all here today so that we may worship you. May you be with our pastors and deliver this message. May you bless our church. Be with everybody that is ill. May you heal them. And we ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, as I mentioned a few moments ago, we're glad that you're all here today. We're glad that Marge is with us today. She's been on hiatus. So, uh, one of the things the trustees will be having a meeting to find out if she needs to be rebaptized. <laughs> <laughs> Teasing you, honey. But we love you. We love you. We really love you. And um, uh, I can't tell you the number of people that we have out sick. Kathy, as you know, uh, that sings with us, uh, she's out sick with a sinus infection, I think. And Sandy's homesick. And uh, we've got some people out of town. Mary and her husband Billy, they're out of town. Um, Ramona and Mary Jane are out of town. I mean, uh, I guess it's that time of year. But we're glad you're here because God brought all the quality people today. Amen. Praise yeah. God. Let's see. Um, we are in the process of working on getting our Tuesday Bible study going again. And so you'll be hearing from us soon. We're hoping that we can start it again. Um, and then we uh, have um, Thursday night Bible study. And we've been having a pretty good time. Well, let me say this. I've been having a really good time. Amen. I'm hoping everybody that's there is having a good time. We've been Amen. studying about spiritual gifts, and it's been a lot of fun. And then we've got Vacation Bible School coming up, as you know. And uh, as always, we need some, some contributions to do some special things. One of the special things that we're going to do is, is something we tried last year. Um, we bought uh, uh, backpacks for all the kids and packed it with stuff to go back to school. And they, so at the last day, they all got a backpack filled with stuff. And um, uh, so we're, tr we're gonna try to do that again this year because we think it's a, a really great gift for the kids. And it helps mom and dad too for not having to purchase so many things for back to school. Um, very soon, you will be constructed, you will see construction taking place on this stage because we're going to build Jerusalem up here. And um, because the whole theme of Vacation Bible School is Jerusalem Marketplace. So we're going to build the Jerusalem Marketplace up here. And it's going to be so much fun. We're going to have a blast. You know what? I have to confess to you. I think I have more kind of fun than the kids do. So but we, we have a great time together. Kids are always very responsive, and uh, it's, it's always a joy to have them in the church and, and to be able to do these special things with them. So be in prayer about that. We're really trying to reach as many people in the community as we can. And uh, so just pray that we'll be able to do that. Now, I'm not sure, but I think that's all of the announcements, I think. So, uh, ushers, if you want to come forward. Carlos will lead us in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, once again, we thank you, Lord God, for taking such good care of us, Lord God, for loving us so, Lord God, that you promised us eternal life, Lord God. I thank you for all that you do for the two 
church and for me, Lord God, and my family. I pray, dear God, for the offering that you would bless both the giver and the gift, Lord God. And we thank you and ask the Lord this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As you know, we started some months ago having prayer time uh, on Sunday morning uh, for a list of people who are ill. Right now our list of people who are ill is 51. Now many of these people we don't even know because they're um, from other states, they're family of people, friends of people, and so we just pray for them. We don't have to know them to pray for them, do we? Amen. Right? Amen. Okay. Um, the first one I wanted to ask, does anybody have someone to add to uh, the prayer list? Not to add, it's for Sharon. Yeah, I think Sharon's already on here. Well, I'm going to add Kathy Bishop. Um, anybody else you can think of? Uh, Anna? Mary Ellen? Yeah, Mary Ellen. Her name, uh, All right. Anybody else? Let's, let's pray then. As we bow our heads, if the Lord brings someone to mind in particular, pray for them right now. Let's just pray for the sick and pray for one another. Johnny, Rachel, Michael, Mary, Nita, Steve, Richard, Alvia, Daniel, Carol, Donna, Nedra, Marge, Anna, Vera, Robert, Jack, Pat, Arlene, and William. Sarah, David, Sam, Jim, George, Mike, Kay, Sharon, Marja, Tony, Karen, Mary, Mike, Mara, Jeremiah, Sherak, Surya, uh, Betsy, jo uh, Josh, Bull, the Simpson family. Um, David Simpson uh, is no longer in the hospital, but they put him in a care home. And the word is that he's really not getting much better, but he, just, he needs constant care. We need to pray for David and Rachel. Both of them are having physical problems. Baby Bennett, um, Joyce, Jared Duncan, my grandson, uh, Cassandra, uh, Bessie, Billy, uh, Priscilla, my niece, um, both of my grandson and my niece were in a car accident, so we didn't keep them out of cars for a while, I think. Uh, Chris, uh, Jennifer's dad, Jacqueline, Kathy, and Mary Ellen. Anybody else you can think of? Um, I've not necessarily had any reports, except Jennifer's dad. Jennifer said that her dad's better getting better. And um, we have any reports on any, any of these people? Yeah. I talked to your girl about this, but I called. She said she found a, she found a Bible study there, and that's where she was going to go to She says, 
Pastor DJ, is that you? And I said, yes, it is. How are you doing? And she's doing pretty good. She's doing pretty good. So, praise the Lord. Well, let's pray together, shall we? Father God, you have heard these names, and you know our hearts. We care for these folks and pray earnestly in Jesus' name that you heal each one of them, that you strengthen each one of them. And many of them, Lord, just need an out and out miracle. And we know that you are a God of miracles. And I just pray that you will work miracles where they are needed, you will heal where it is needed, and you will bless where it is needed. God, each, each one of these people I know are precious to you. Touch them in Jesus' name, I pray. And for our church, for the needs of our church, Lord, I pray in Jesus' name that you will bless us and, Lord, that we will be the church you called us and want us to be. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
if you noticed it or not in the bulletin. But it says that we're going to be preaching from Acts today. Now, we've been preaching from um, Mark, but we finished Mark. Now, I know I haven't done the last two chapters of Mark, but we did them back for Easter and for um, the Lord's Supper. So, technically, we finished with uh, Mark a little bit backwards, but we got the job done. And I know that you enjoyed it. Several of you have told me that you enjoyed it. But now we're going to start in the book of um, Acts. And uh, basically, we're going to be talking about the church, how the church started, um, what God hopes to do with the church. But this, this uh, book, we call it a book, it's te technically a letter that, that Luke wrote. And um, it, it has a rich history in it. And you'll notice in the very first couple verses of, um, of Acts, it says, and this is, remember this is Luke speaking, the first account I composed, Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up to heaven, after he had by the Holy Spirit given orders to the apostles whom he had chosen. So the reason I wanted to read this in particular, and we're going to turn to Luke and look at another section in just a minute. This is a letter that Luke wrote to Theophilus. The, the word Theophilus in Greek literally means lover of God. So, and we're going to see in the next verse we, uh, verses we read, Theophilus was a believer. He was a close friend of Luke's. And Luke wrote to him to keep him updated with what was going on in the church. Now, in, in Luke chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, I want you to see how he addresses this one. Because Luke wrote that, and it, it was a letter to Theophilus as well. He said, since many have undertaken to compile an account of the things accomplished among us, just as they were handed down to us, by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and services, servants of the Lord. It seems fitting to me as well, having investigated everything carefully from the beginning, to write it out for you in an orderly sequence, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the exact truth about the things that have been taught. So Luke was very much aware of what was going on in the early church with the letters that were being written by Paul, uh, with what um, Mark had written, with what Matthew and John had written. And so what he specifically tried to do in the Gospel of Luke was to give a very sequential account of everything that happened in the way it happened. Luke was a very intelligent man and he took pretty much a scholarly approach to the book of, of the letter of Luke and the letter of Acts. But I have no doubt in my mind that he was led of the Holy Spirit. You can see it, you can read it, you can feel it as you read both of his letters. Now, this, um, uh, we find something else that's interesting about Luke. At the very end of the book of Luke, he, he gives an account of what happened the last time the apostles saw Jesus. He starts Acts with the same event. And it's kind of interesting to see how he does this. Um, and now, in, in Luke chapter 24, um, we're, we're reminded that uh, these believers were witnesses to the resurrection of Jesus. Without a doubt, they saw things happen. And they saw Jesus uh, hung on the cross. They saw him die. They saw him after he raised from the grave and he ate with them and talked with them and taught them. And they saw him when he ascended into heaven. It says in Luke chapter 24, verses 44 through 53, Now he said to them, These are my words which I spoke to you 
while I was still with you, that all things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written, that the Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead on the third day, and that repentance for forgiveness of sin would be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things, and behold, I am sending forth the promise of my Father upon you, but you are to stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. And he led them out as far as Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. While he was blessing them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. And they, after worshiping him, returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple, praising God. So we have this account of the apostles and the early church gathered around, watching Jesus rise and, and ascend. And you know, technically, that's what made the gospel complete. The life of Jesus, his birth, his death, his burial, his resurrection, were all part of the gospel, but it was not complete until he ascended into heaven and they saw him. That completed the gospel, and it helped them to understand better what was going on. Now, getting into Acts, where we left off, in, in verse 3 of chapter 1, um, Luke writes, To these he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over a period of 40 days and speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. Now see, he's pick, picking right up where he left off in his first letter. Gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised. He said, you heard of from me, for John baptized you with water, but he will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time that you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it is not. It's not for you to know. Times or epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. One of the things that Jesus has called us to, and we have referred to it often as the Great Commission, our commission to preach the gospel, our commission to pray for the sick and the needy, our commission to take the gospel to the area around us as well as the area out and beyond us. And he emphasizes that to the church. It's his last words to the church. That's why we put such emphasis on them because he could have said many things to us. But he said, Go ye therefore and preach the gospel to all nations and explaining to them who Jesus is and that he offers salvation and salvation comes with forgiveness. Now, um, I remember when I was a boy especially, and, and uh, that's a very long time ago, but all my early life as a Christian, I wondered about the mission field. To go somewhere else and preach the gospel, to go here and go there, places you've never been before, places where you don't even speak the language. How can you go and do these things that God wants us to do, to reach them with the gospel? People who perhaps 
have never even heard of Jesus before. So I prayed about this, and I don't want you to think that I'm trying to build myself up here at all. But I want to show you what the real mission field looks like, because I was there. That's one of the first pictures that was taken of me when I was going through the jungle in Uganda to get to a village nearby to preach. Sometimes that's the only place we had to walk, was in pathways through the jungle. Where's that one? next one with the motorcycle? In, in Africa, I had a motorcycle. That's the only way I could get anywhere. And when I could get by a road, and, and sometimes I could only walk, but um, I used this motorcycle to go all over Uganda and Kenya and Tanzania. And um, I was grateful to have it too. Um, show this, the, the little church, the, that one. This is what a church looks like in the mission field. Barely a building. These people love the Lord. And they were so proud of their church that they built themselves. The man right there on your right with his hand raised, that was the pastor, Pastor Yvonne. And he loved those people and he loved the Lord. And he, him and his wife and family spent their whole life building this church and ministering to these people. Show the one in the Philippines. This is a picture in the Philippines right after we were at a church and had just finished vacation Bible school. I spent several trips, missionary trips, to um, the Philippines, mostly on the island of Leyte. But when I first went there, I preached in Manila and Antipolo. And uh, the interesting thing that I noticed in the Philippines is they are so hungry to hear the word of God. I mean, seriously. And in Antipolo, the police chief made it a mandate that all of his people had to go to one of my meetings where I was preaching. And I preached, and half of them gave their hearts to Jesus. And they were so hungry to hear the word of God. Um, was there another one? No. That, is that it? That's it. Okay. So that gives you some idea of what it looks like out there. And um, uh, I remember the first time I went to Africa and started looking around, I just went gold. You know, I thought, how is this going to work? And it gets kind of scary, but you know what? When God takes you somewhere to minister as a missionary or a preacher or as a, a, just a witness of Jesus, he always provides a way. Amen. That motorcycle that I was riding was given to me so that I can have transportation from place to place. God provides all the things that we need to do his work. So when we read the Great Commission and talking about going therefore into all the world and preaching the gospel, that means a lot of things. And all the places are different. Um, one of the pictures that I had sent but didn't come out I uh, went to Cambodia as well. And uh, I have a picture of me on a little pathway between rice paddies. And I'm walking from one place to another. But I've stopped and there's this big mound that looks like a, a, a small volcano. And I put my foot up on it and had my picture taken. And uh, everybody asks me, well, what in the world was that big mound? It was an ambulance. You should have seen the ants in that baby. Probably nine or ten of them could have carried it off. <laughs> Things are different over there. The first place I stayed was a halfway house, and there's a little twin bed in there. I went in to go to bed, pulled the covers back, and there was a centipede about this long curled up in the middle of the bed. I mean, it gets very interesting. And I was telling Dennis this morning, that I even had an elephant chase me one time. And that's probably the most scared I've ever been in my life. Um, but fortunately, uh, 
he got he became disinterested and went on to, to tear some limbs from a tree that he believes. So you know, God puts you in some interesting situations that are amazing when we step back and look at them. But when you're there, you're trusting God and you know God's going to take care of us. And he always does. It's one of the most wonderful feelings in the world to know that you are there by the mandate to share the gospel. I'm by here by mandate to share the gospel too. But it's different there than it is here. We don't have any elephants here in one thing. But anyway, I wanted to just show you those pictures to give you an idea of what going to all the world, some picture of what it looks like a little bit. And it kind of, it, it, it helps a little bit, I think. Now, um, we're back in verse nine of Acts chapter one. And it says in verse nine, and after he had said these things, and he was just telling them about um, uh, wanting them to go out with him, that the Holy Spirit would be coming to bless them and be poured out upon them. He said, after he had said these things, he was lifted up while they were looking on, and a cloud received him out of sight, just like what Luke wrote in his gospel. That must have been an incredible moment to see Jesus raised and just disappear in the clouds. But Luke adds something else here. Look what it says. And as they were gazing intently into the sky while he was going. Behold, two men in white and white clothing excuse me, stood beside him. And they also said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come in just the same way as you watched him go into heaven. He's going to come back the same way. And he's going to have an army of angels with him. And he's going to do all the things that the word says that he will do and correct and make. Now I was wondering what it would be like to be standing around with Jesus on that day with the, with the little church, the apostles. And suddenly he begins rising up and you look and you follow him. And then when you're all done watching him, then two angels appear and say, what are you looking into the sky for? That's done. He's coming back. And you have work to do till he comes. And I have to tell you this, and, and you're going to laugh, and maybe you're going to think, what's wrong with that picture? I don't know. But do you remember watching um, a show on TV called uh, Homer Pyle? Gomer Pyle, uh, Marie is Marie. Gomer Pyle used to say this thing. He said, Golly! And every time I think of these people watching Jesus go up <laughs> into heaven, stand around and say, Golly! And then these two angels appear and they're speechless. You know what? I, I don't even think we can even grasp how remarkable that was Amen. to see Jesus rise up and disappear in the clouds. Can you imagine? And they look at each other, I can imagine, they say, you know what? I think everything that man told us is true. Because this was sort of the icing on the cake to show that the death on the cross, don't worry about that. The resurrection, don't worry about that. I'm going into heaven and I'm going to sit down at the right hand of the throne of God. And so when we think of Jesus today, we think of him in heaven at the right hand of the throne of God. So you see, there are some things happening uh, in this day that were remarkable. And I'm not sure that there's anything that has happened since that is more remarkable than this. Anyway, he goes on now. Now the, this little group, this little troop, which, which they refer to as the early church, is about 120 people which was made up of the apostles and um, Mary, the mother of Jesus, and her family, and many other families were there. And they were gathering in the upper room. And it says, when they returned to Jerusalem from the Mount called Olive, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away, 
When they had entered the city, they went up to the upper room where they were staying, uh, where they were staying. That is Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, the son of uh, Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, the son of James. These all with one mind were continually devoting themselves to prayer along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. They were praying. They were seeking the direction of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know what? That's exactly what we're supposed to be doing today. Amen. We're supposed to be praying continually, asking God what he would have us do, where he would have us go, who he would have us pray for, because God will reveal those things to you if you ask him. And that's exactly what was happening here. Now notice, um, Okay, verse 15. At this time, Peter stood up in the midst of the brethren. A gathering of about 120 persons was there together, and he said, Brethren, the scripture had to be fulfilled when the Holy Spirit foretold by the mount of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was counted among us and received his share in the ministry. We're talking about Judas now. There was two Judases. One was the brother of um, uh, the, the son of James. This was Judas Iscariot, the one who um, betrayed Jesus. And he said, Now this man acquired a field with the price of his wickedness, and calling, falling headlong, he burst out in the middle of all, and his intestines gushed out. Now that's not a real pretty sight, I know. But it's his word. Judas came to a rather abrupt ending because he had been paid 30 pieces of silver to betray Jesus. And he took that money and bought a field. Verse 19, and it became known to all who were living in Jerusalem so that in their own language that field was called Hecatomah, that is, the field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, let his homestead be made desolate, and let no one dwell in it. And let another man take his office. This is what led the apostles to elect another apostle because they were originally 12. Now they were 11. This is how that happened. Therefore it is necessary that of the men who have accompanied us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning with the baptism, his baptism of John, until the day that he was taken up from us. One of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. So they put together two men, Joseph called Barsabbas, who was also called Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, You, Lord, who knows the hearts of all men, show which one of these two you have chosen to occupy this ministry and the apostleship from which Judas turned us aside to go his own place. And they threw lots, and the lot fell to Matthias, and he was added to the 11 apostles. Now, a lot of people look at that and they say, well, wait a minute, they threw lots. Why didn't they just pray and ask God, God, which one do you want to be the apostle? But there was a good, historical reason for drawing lots. Show that picture of the army government. These two items were, were similar to dice, but they were flat, round and flat. And the high priest of the temple wore them on each side of his vest. There was little pockets. And he would put them in those pockets. And he always had them with him. When a serious decision needed to be made, that they were not certain of what God would have them do, they would take the Urim and the Thurman and throw them on the ground. And however they turned up was the answer to, to their inquiry. So drawing lots was very similar to what they did in the temple to make decisions. Now, unfortunately, today, because see, keep in mind, they did not have the Holy Spirit at this time. And they didn't know which man should we choose. And God chose Matthias. Now, chapter 2, we're only 
going to read four verses or five. We talk about the day of Pentecost because this is it's part of all this. A lot of people <clears throat> don't even know what Pentecost means. Pentecost means 50 days from Passover. So 50 days ago, they had their Passover. And we know what the Passover was all about. It had to do with Jesus delivering the children of Israel from Egypt. And he had brought a curse upon the, uh, the Egyptians that their firstborn would die for their failure to allow the children of Israel to leave. And he said, if you will sacrifice the lamb and put its blood on the lintel and the doorpost, the death angel will pass you by. And while, you're, while this is happening, you are to roast the lamb and eat it while standing with bitter herbs and your staff ready to leave. That was the Passover. Now you recall, his apostles asked Jesus when that day was coming, um, Lord, uh, where would you have us share the Passover meal together? It was not a question of, are we going to celebrate the Passover? Are we going to have a Passover meal? That was a given. Every Jew celebrated the Passover. And so you recall, Jesus told them that there was an upper room. And if they would go in this direction down this little road, that they would find uh, a place. And a man would be there, and they said, the master has need of your room, that he would let us use it. And that's how they got their upper room. All right? So, um, 50 days from the Passover is Pentecost. Pentecost also means Shabbat, which is the Feast of Weeks. Um, now, in those days, Pentecost had to do with the Old Testament and the Jews, and it had to do with, with their perspective of Passover and their perspective of Pentecost. Pentecost, to us today, as the church, takes on a new life because something happened on the day of Pentecost. Um, in verse 1, chapter 2, when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them, to them tongues as a fire distributing themselves, and they rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit had given them utterance. Now there were Jews living in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred and the crowd came together, they were bewildered because, listen, because each one of them was hearing them speak in their own language. So the tongues that were being spoken in the upper room, while the Holy Spirit was poured out upon them, they were literally languages that the church and the apostles were speaking, and the people out in the street heard the message in their own language because all these visitors from other places had come to Jerusalem for Pentecost. Next week, we're going to talk about what happened next. But I wanted you to see the importance of the Holy Spirit being poured out upon the church at this specific time. There was a reason it was done on Pentecost. Because the people in the street would recognize what they were saying. Because they could not all speak Hebrew or even Greek for that matter. So you see how God works. Now then, um, we've been studying about spiritual gifts on uh, Thursday night. And uh, one of the spiritual gifts is tongues. Speaking in tongues. And there is a mandate about speaking in tongues that when someone speaks in tongues, there must be an interpretation. 
And so if you speak in tongues, you're supposed to do it in such a way that you know that someone is there that has the gift to interpret for you. It's, a, it's designed to be a sign from God. If there is no one there to interpret, you're not supposed to speak in tongues. Uh, one time, it was on Good Friday, and I was pastoring in Manteca. This was a long time ago. Back when old ship was a pub. And uh, uh, our, our community had a pastor's uh, group of all the pastors there. There was Assembly of God, Nazarene, Four Square, Pentecostal Holiness, Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian. And we all met once a month for breakfast and talked. And every year we planned a meeting on Good Friday and someone in the group would be chosen to preach the message on Good Friday. That was one of the things that we did uh, for the community. It just happened on this one, this one year, I was chosen to be the speaker on Good Friday. And the event took place in the Assembly of God Church, which happened to be the biggest church in town. So that's why we went there. And they had this huge balcony. Place was packed. And I was preaching. And all of a sudden, a guy in the back got me, stood up and started speaking in tongues loud. And so I just backed up and went like this. And he finished speaking in tongues. And I didn't do anything. I waited. Why? There has to be an interpretation. Amen. That's what the Bible says. So I waited. Well, it got a little uncomfortable for a while. And then before long, a woman stood up and gave the interpretation. And then I came back up to the pulpit and took a right where I left off. And it was a good message. It's a wonderful message to all of us who are believers and the significance of Good Friday. But I remember that specifically because while he was speaking in tongues, God was telling me, don't you speak until there's an interpretation. And I said, well, God, what am I supposed to do? Just stand here quietly? And, and that's what he had me do until it, it got done. You see, I know a lot of times um, people think that spiritual gifts and tongues and prophecy and all the things that we read about and talk about and uh, occasionally see, uh, we see that sometimes a little recklessly. Because sometimes it's handled recklessly. And it sort of removes itself from the meaning of it. But when it's done appropriately, according to God's word, obedient to God, those things become so precious to us that God blesses us. And um, so anyway, spiritual gifts now has come to the church. They did not have spiritual gifts prior to that. Now, it does say that the Holy Spirit would come upon them. Like when Jesus sent out the apostles two by two, he sent them out two by two and instructed them to go and preach, to cast out demons, and to heal the sick. And they did that, and he blessed them, and the Holy Spirit came upon them, and off they went. The Holy Spirit didn't go in them. The Holy Spirit didn't fill them. The Holy Spirit was upon them. And you'll look at the Old Testament, and you'll see many occasions where somebody was filled, was uh, the Holy Spirit was upon them. And said so the Holy Spirit came upon David when he slew the Goliath. The Holy Spirit came upon Samuel when he anointed David to be the new king of Israel. And these important events that needed somebody specifically to lead them, it says the Holy Spirit would come upon them. But here we have a different situation. The Holy Spirit comes within us and lives within us and guides us and directs us and speaks to us. Here's the problem. When you become a Christian, when you give your heart to Jesus, when 
you ask him to forgive you of your sins. It says that when you're genuine and true about those things, the Holy Spirit will come to live in you. Amen. Never to leave. Paul taught us in many places that the Holy Spirit will never leave you or forsake you. He's with you forever. But here's the problem. You have the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit doesn't always have you. Amen. Follow that. We have the Holy Spirit because we're believers. God promised us the Holy Spirit. But that doesn't mean the Holy Spirit has control of us. Because sometimes, even as believers, we do our own thing. And our attitude is, I don't have to explain to anybody. But, you know. And so consequently, some of us fall out of fellowship with God. I'm not saying you lose your, your salvation. That's, that can't happen. I'm not saying that God's angry with you. It's just that you're out of fellowship. If you had small children at any time, and you told your children what to do, and they just stand there to walk off to their room, you know, in defiance. Does that ring a bell with anybody? Amen. That's when people leave the fellowship of their family when they're defiant. And dad or mom has to go in and sit down. Buddy, we can't have this. You're going to have to straighten up and follow the rules of this family. I've had that talk a few times with Jonathan. With James, with Laura, with Becca. And uh, it's what parents have to do. And grandparents have to do it sometimes too. But sometimes we become defiant before God. God, I'm sorry. I just can't do that. Don't ask me again. I was that way for several years. When I was a young man. God had been talking to me about being a preacher since I was seven years old. I know that's very hard to believe. But it just so happened that at that, that, that age, I was very close to my pastor. He and I were friends, and sometimes he would take me with him to go visit somebody if there were gonna be kids there. And we, we were just friends. And I was impressed with this pastor, and I felt like you know, I think God wants me to grow up and do this. Well, as I got a little older, that became more and more unpopular in my life because I saw other things I wanted to do. One thing was I wanted to be a cowboy. I was only seven, come on. And I, you know, I wanted to do this and I wanted to do that. And eventually I went in the army and went overseas and came back and I was a deputy sheriff, still unwilling to do what God wanted me. Went to church every Sunday, taught a Sunday school class. And I tried to appease God by becoming a gospel singer. I said, I'll tell you what, God. I don't need to preach, I'll just sing. And I'll sing my message to everybody. And God blessed that for a while. But one night, I was a deputy sheriff. I was working the night shift at the hospital that used to be called um, Orange County Medical Center a long, long time ago. Now it's um, University of Irvine Medical Center. On the third floor, we had a, a jail ward. I think it had three or four rooms where somebody that had been arrested, maybe they had been shot or injured, and they were there for medical treatment, or maybe they were in jail and got sick. And, and, and so they always had to have a deputy on duty. And I had the midnight shift for a week because I was on vacation relieving for other deputies. The nurse would come, and uh, I'd open the door with my key and stand by the door while she went in and gave a shot and gave medication or took his temperature, whatever. And then she would leave and I would shut the door and lock it. I went outside on the balcony and I had my foot up on 
the, uh, the railing that was around the little porch that was out there on the third floor. And I'm sorry, I was smoking a cigarette, taking a break, and out of the clear blue sky, as clear as anything as I have ever heard in my life, God said to me, DJ, I'm not going to ask you again. You're called to preach. Within a month, I quit the sheriff's department and went back to seminary because I knew that God meant business and I was so afraid that God would not ever ask me to do anything again and scare me. And so I decided to obey him. Many Christians can trace back their history with the Lord to an event like that or a situation like that where God spoke to them and told them to do this or do that and they didn't want to. That's my experience. You probably might have another one. Or praise the Lord, maybe he never had to do that with you. Maybe you just always obey him. But we have periods in our life where we become defiant against God. God, I tried that before. It didn't work. I'm not going to do it again. Or Lord, I showed up down at that Sunday school class at church every Sunday, every Sunday, and nobody comes. This can't be of you. You know, you know what I'm talking about. We have to let the Holy Spirit lead us and guide us in all that we do as believers. This is the first time the Holy Spirit came to the church and filled it. And it's one of the most precious times that we can go back to and connect with as a church. I'd like you to bow your heads, please. Heavenly Father, we all come from different places. And Lord, you've had to work in each of our lives in different ways to get our attention, to teach us, to show us the way, to minister to us so that we can minister to others. And sometimes, Lord, we miss the road. You want us to go down the narrow road and we jump on over on the wide road that's a lot easier to walk on. And then Satan goes to work and discourages us and says, why in the world do you want to waste your time serving God? This is going nowhere. We have to honor and obey God. If we are true believers, if Jesus is in our heart, if the Holy Spirit is in our life, we have to believe and listen to God and do what he tells us to do. And God will always find a way for us. God will always lead us. And the Bible says he will never leave us nor forsake us. I want to pray for you this morning. If there's anybody here that is struggling with something in their life, or you may know of somebody in your family or someone else that's struggling with something in their life. I know of a couple of people who have family that are struggling with receiving Christ. Things happen in many mysterious ways. And I'd like to pray for you this morning. And if I pray for you, and that's the case, I pray for them as well. Would you raise your hand? I know I'm just looking around. I see you. Yes, I see all of you, many of you. Heavenly Father, you have seen the hands <clears throat> that were raised this morning. God, in each situation, I pray that you will work and reveal yourself and that you will help each believer to be the person you called them to be, that you will bless them, that you will give them, give them the words when necessary, that you will teach them how to pray in these situations. And Lord, that as they seek you, you will show them the way. I'm asking you, Lord, to bless them and to give them understanding. Father, we love you. And we praise you. We bless you. We want to be all that you've called us to be. Sometimes we use the excuse that we don't know what God wants us to do. But another part of the problem.
problems we've never asked you. God has a ministry for you. God has a job for you. And if you seek him, you will find him. The Bible says when you seek the Lord with all your heart, you will find him. And sometimes maybe we just need to slow down, pause, and pray and say, God, I need for you to show me what to do here because I'm not sure what to do. Or I pray for so-and-so, my friend, my father, my brother, my sister, my uncle. They're struggling with getting saved. Please, Lord, help them to be saved and help me to know what to say to them. God is there to help you, to listen to you, to bless you. God, hear our prayer today. We thank you for this message because it has revealed to us how you established the first church. And we are part of that church. I love Amen. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. God bless you, folks. God bless you. Have a great week.